All right, all right. Welcome everybody to another edition of Legend Sports Amplify. We're talking baseball history, sports history, Negro League history, art, you name it. And today I am really, really excited to have on Brian Powers of Bandbox Ballparks. How you doing, Brian? Doing great, Phil. Thank you for having me. Oh, thank you. This is great. Uh, you're taking time out of your day to uh, share what you do, and and um, <clears throat> we didn't get a chance to talk too much before we got online here. But what I'm trying to do here is is highlight uh, all the efforts that people have been making uh, over the years. Some entire life <laughs> they've spent <laughs> in you know uh, authors, researchers, historians. Uh, you know, people like yourself who have done work with uh, on the design side and and with with the baseball history of the stadiums, uh, artists, uh, you name it, to get their stories out there and and uh, uh, tell uh, you know the history of not just the game. I, I'm focusing a lot on on the Negro Leagues and, and some of those efforts, and that was really how I I, I came across what you were doing because uh, to me it's it's. You know the work that you've done with historical parks, and then how it ties into the Negro Leagues is just uh, fascinating to me. So, um, I, I I love origin stories. So if you could just tell us how'd you get into what you're doing and why you're doing it, and I think people would love to hear that. Sure, it's been uh, quite a process uh, over this uh, last uh, 30 years, but uh, I've always had an interest in baseball growing up. And uh, uh, back when I was in college uh, at Auburn University. Uh, my eyes started to open a little bit as I was honing in my studies, you know, my thesis project and everything. I was really starting to look into neighborhoods, you know, things that impacted neighborhoods and the people that lived them. And I was always drawn, you know, to the sporting side of things, uh, baseball being one of them. And uh, it was uh, almost uh, second my last year in school. I took a uh, field trip uh, with some other students uh, to Chicago. Uh, from Alabama, and we spent a week in Chicago, and uh, uh, second to the last day we were here, uh, they gave us a free day, you know, just to kind of go around the city, so uh, I thought, well, uh, dawned on me that this is going to be, this is 1990, this is going to be the last year uh, that Comiskey Park uh, right. well, was going to be in use by the White Sox, and uh, I thought, well, I could at least go, always go to Wrigley later, so I, I hopped on the red line and uh, went down to 35th, uh, got off there and uh, I was armed with my sketchbook and uh, uh, camera and just thought I would just kind of go through and uh, check out old Comiskey Park, kind of pay it one last uh, respect uh, during its final season. So that's what I did. I, I spent the day there. Uh, I just uh, really kind of uh, looked around the place. I, 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 I was kind of fascinated by the details and what was uh being the oldest ballpark in the major leagues at that time, uh, I really kind of wanted to make note of it. And uh, so I proceeded to take pictures, sketches, whatnot. And, and as, as I was going through this, it, it kind of dawned on me that uh, there's not really much being done to preserve uh, the legacy of the ballpark. You know, I was watching the new one you know, grow across the street, but as, you know, as everybody known, uh, after the season was over, uh, Comiskey Park was going to meet the wrecking ball and, uh, oh, Nothing was gonna gonna be saved from it, and uh, uh, kind of in the pit of my stomach, I thought, well, gosh, that's a shame. And I, I think these designers need to be very cognizant of the legacies in which our buildings and our neighborhoods uh, are. So, uh, as, as I was going back to school, I, I was thinking about that, and uh, I'm thinking, gosh, if, if there's a way I could somehow have an impact uh, in the pre preservation of architecture some of these sporting events. I mean, as you know, uh, the early 90s was the beginning of the building boom. You know, we saw a lot of all parks uh, come and go. And uh, certainly an exciting time to be a baseball fan, no doubt. But uh, but sure enough, uh, the next year, uh, Comiskey Park uh, did meet the wrecking ball. Uh, it, was, you know, it was made into the parking lot. Yeah, there's a concrete home plate there, but uh, really there's nothing there uh, to show for it. Uh, but what happened when uh, Comiskey Park came down uh, Rickwood Field in Birmingham, Alabama, became uh, the oldest uh, ballpark used in the country. It was built in 1910 and opened just uh, a few weeks before Comiskey Park did. And that was right in my backyard. Wow. I thought, well, gosh, uh, uh, this is right here. Uh, maybe there's something I can do uh, to help Rickwood uh, so it won't meet the same fate as old Comiskey Park did. So uh, right at that time, uh, there's a grassroots effort being formed uh, called Friends of Rickwood. Uh, once Comiskey Park came down uh, in 1992, uh, Friends of Rickwood was formed, and I was one of the charter members of that. 
Um, so what that allowed me to do was uh, I, I spent quite a bit of time, you know, going up on weekends, helping out restoring the park. That was one of their first uh, acts was to restore the park. By that time, the Birmingham Barons, uh, which which played in that ballpark, I've uh, been playing at the Hoover Met, you know, for several years. So uh, the ballpark was kind of its, on its last uh, leg, so to speak. And uh, it was at that point in time I was exposed to uh, Historical American Building Survey, or HABS. Uh, uh, Rick Wood uh, was able to get a grant to have uh, representatives or, or other students actually uh, come spend the summer at the park and uh, architecturally document the park so they could have a, a formalized record at the Library of Congress. Wow. So I was sitting there you know, watching him do this effort, and I said, gosh, I got to be doing this. <laughs> right. well, I, in a sense, I, I think that was really when the, when the seeds were truly planted, and I thought at that time maybe I, I could certainly have an impact. Uh, it's, so, it's beautiful, man. I'll tell you, the and, and did Rickwood Park, isn't that where they filmed uh, 42 as well? I mean, another... Yeah, there, there are a few movies. Uh, exactly, there are a few movies that were actually filmed there. Uh, Cobb was filmed mm -hmm. uh, first. Uh, I think it was 1995, mm -hmm. and then uh, 42 uh, was parts of it were filmed there uh, as well. Several years later, but uh, yeah, I was actually invited to. Uh, yeah, I, I worked as kind of an extra, you know, for Cobb. And if you go to my oh, website, wow. I got a few pictures of it. Cool. Uh, you know, in the filming of it <laughs> while we were there, but. Uh, that, that was really one of the goals because uh, the park at the time didn't really have any revenue stream. You know, no team was really formally playing in it. Mm -hmm. So they had to think outside the box a little bit. Well, how are we going to get funds, you know, to rehabilitate this ballpark? And uh, uh, when news came out that they were scouting locations uh, to film the movie Cobb, Rick would fit the bill perfectly. Mm -hmm. So Hollywood was able to infuse, you know, money. You know, they were able to restore, put a new scoreboard in, which replicated the old one. Awesome. Uh, repaint you know, the period fences, you know, that you see in the movie. Uh, general rehabilitation of the grandstands and uh, that really spruced up the park and uh, I think it really opened everybody's eyes to uh, what can be done from a preservation standpoint you know, so they film a movie yeah that is yeah, awesome Birmingham Bears, <clears throat> yeah college <throat> games Birmingham Barons play one game a year uh, there every year now so that was what I was going to ask you uh, so this is 19 so people who aren't familiar with that this is 1910 and Rickwood was actually built before Comiskey Park yeah, it actually opened, uh, I want to say, it was probably about four or five weeks before Comiskey Park did. Wow. And were, you, were yeah. you aware growing up as a kid um, of the the history of that ballpark? Did you know much about it before you found out later on about what was going on with it? It wasn't really until uh, I was in college I really understood the significance of it. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, I was starting to do, in fact, my research was uh, a master plan to redevelop a corridor between Rickwood Field and downtown Birmingham because uh, that whole area of town was uh, going under a massive transition at the time. And uh, during that wow. period of research, it really opened my eyes uh, to what it was. But uh, uh, yeah, I, I had a lot of friends in Birmingham that I grew up there, uh, went to games there as a kid. and. Uh, uh, much like my initial impressions of Comiskey, I uh, was surprised it's, it's kind of been sitting there the whole time because uh, once the Birmingham Barons left, I think it was 1987, uh, to the Hoover Met, uh, nobody was really using Rickwood Field. I mean, uh, it started to become overgrown, uh, things of that sort. And for the most part, it was destined for the wrecking ball. And mm. uh, I think just with a few key people, much like we're seeing with some of these other preservation efforts, it really took an aggressive and a grassroots effort to, uh, to keep it going. It's awesome. I, you know, that's one of the things I'm trying to highlight on here as well. Not, not only just the efforts of, of people to preserve this history and legacy like yourself and the researchers and authors, but also um, to give people an idea that <clears throat> the history of the game and not just the game, but even Negro League Baseball is all around them. D during the days of, of the early days of black baseball and Negro League Baseball, barnstorming teams traveled everywhere and and how many people i've talked to even just recently that did not even realize that right in their own backyard or very very close by was a pretty significant piece of history uh and they never knew about it and and i you know i just i'm hoping people you know can maybe uh explore that a little bit more because i bet you there's something in their area somewhere uh, whether it was a barnstorming tour, a team, a player from that area that had some impact on, on, on things. And, and it really, in those early days, especially with barnstorming, it grew the game and it, it, it grew the brand of baseball. And it's another aspect of, 
uh, the Negro Leagues, I think that uh, most people are unaware of uh, the impact that they had on that. So I, I'm really, I'm glad that the efforts that you're making here are just, I mean, I think they're fantastic. And I, I can hardly wait to show people what these look like in a second. I've got your website because I, I, I go on it just to, just for the, you know, it, it, it's just to me spectacular. I, it, it gives you the feel that you're actually in those golden boxes in Comiskey Park. And it's just beautiful. So that was what I wanted to ask you um, next. What... How are you designing these ballparks? Do you have the blueprints? How? How? What? What's the process in some of these that you had to go? Let, let's use uh, you know Comiskey as an example. Comiskey, uh, I really uh, the ballparks that you see on my website, and uh, as I develop them, you know, as I update, uh, everything I do is really authentic uh, based on the on blueprints. Uh, I try to approach it much like the original builders did. Uh, the Comiskey Park effort, and, uh, same thing with Lee. Uh, these were the efforts of a kind of a long period of time in which uh, I spent a lot of time going from place to place, spent a lot of time in basements, uh, repositories, you know, municipal files, anywhere where you could conceivably find any records uh, of these ballparks. Uh, I probably tried to tap those resources. So you're a historian and, too. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> no doubt. Yeah. Well, it's interesting. I mean, I, I think that's, you that's really know that at first, right? <laughs> Yeah. I mean, it's, that's, that's what makes the whole process fun is, mm -hmm. you know, uh, the element of discovery. Because uh, originally when, it, when I uh, started doing this, I, I just really wanted to acquire information just to uh, have the ability to, to share it. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think when I mentioned the, uh, the Habs effort through Woodgrid, I, I thought, well, gosh, it'd probably be pretty cool maybe to uh, do a couple other ballparks in the same manner. So that's when I really embarked on the Comiskey Park effort. So I really... Uh, tried to search up the archives, you know, for blueprints and things like that. And uh, I was very fortunate uh, uh, through some of my professional contacts and the sheer stroke of luck, I was able to come across, you know, a lot of that information. Uh, Comiskey Park was a culmination of almost 25, 30 years of, of work, you know, before you even saw some of these images I started to put together. My original plan was I just I wanted to put together maybe just a series of consolidated drawings, maybe put those in the mm -hmm. Library of Congress have those available for people that want to look at them. But, uh, but I think one thing that's really helped in this whole effort is the advancement of technology and information sharing that's involved, evolved in the last 10 years. Mm -hmm. I mean, back 10, 15 years ago, we didn't have the ability to three-dimensionally create what we did, but uh, in, in the manner in which we do now, uh, it was totally different than what we have. The tools and resources uh, mm -hmm. were a lot there. Uh, you know, our, our whole profession has changed and, uh, same thing while that was going on, my thought process has changed too. And I, I think as designers, professionals, uh, historians, uh, I mean, one of the things we witness in front of us is how things change over a period of time. And we have to have the ability to adapt to it. So the same thing applies to my knowledge sharing. Mm -hmm. I'm always looking for new creative ways to share these experiences. Awesome. What software do you use when you're designing these ballparks or is it a different, is it different manners of it? Actually, uh, all the three-dimensional images uh, you see, I use what's called uh, Revit. Uh, it's R-E-V-I-T. It's a, it's a, what we call in the industry a building information modeling software that uh, allows you to uh, effectively create uh, working models uh, that house data and families to be able to uh, kind of uh, adapt to uh, to the building, you know, you're put together. Uh, it's a little different than maybe just a simple uh, sketch up extrusion. You know, it's, it's what we call smart software. Mm -hmm. You know, you could, uh, I could build what we call families and components, you know, like trusses, seats, you know, things of that sort. Mm -hmm. And uh, I could put data in inside each one of those elements. And that allows me to, you know, as I put, as I build these models, I could extract information uh, over a period of time I could use it as research to compare and contrast maybe with other projects, you know, that I do. That's, a, that's the same software we use on a, on a daily basis professionally. And I, mm -hmm. that's where the industry is really going. So I try to apply that, you know, into my research as well. Awesome. And how long does a project like this take? Again, using Comiskey, how long did that take to come to your finished product of, a, of, of what we're seeing now? Comiskey Park took me almost... Uh, about 13 months, a little, little bit less than that, I, you know, to model. Uh, I was very fortunate to, uh, like I said, it's a culmination of many years of accumulation and research. So I had a lot of that at my fingertips. 
but uh, just purely on the, on the modeling side of it, uh, that's about what it took. Uh, League Park, by contrast, is probably nine months. But again, it's just uh, kind of on, on a time available basis. You know, mm-hmm. I try to put an hour or two each night. Uh, whenever I have time, it's not your day job, right? Yeah, I get it. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to, uh, I'm going to go ahead and put your uh, website up so people can see this because like I said, I, I go on it every once in a while now just to like, um, it's like an experience. It, it really is. I, I even, even just the screen, I mean, right there, the actual entrance screen to your website to me is just, uh, are you kidding me? I mean, <laughs> I, I, I literally feel like I'm in a drone flyover and it, it's just, it's beautiful. Uh, it really is. Yeah. I, I appreciate it. It's uh, really what I try to do is to really capture the experience. You mm-hmm. know, I would, That's uh, really what uh, it because seems really, like. yeah. Case of Comiskey park. Uh, it's been a whole generation since, uh, people have walked through the gates and, mm-hmm. uh, sure. You know, you see all the game photos and footage and things, but, uh, I want to, I want people to feel what it's like uh, to uh, hand over your ticket, walk inside, get a hot dog, you know, find your seat, uh, look around a little bit. That's, that's what baseball is. That's what it felt like to me. I mean, that's why I wanted people to see this because to me, that was the that was the experience that it that it felt like. So you've even got it labeled that way. I see, right? Take your find your seat. Take right. Your I was field. able to break it down in several elements here, components of the ballpark, different areas, so you could go into it. You have a, I was able to create 360 degree pans, interactive uh, views. Ticket booth, no kidding. I mean, I, it, it's incredible to me. It, it really, really is. I mean, this is not, this is not real. This is a 3D model. And to me, yep. uh, I, I can't even, so I can, I can literally <laughs> spin it any way I want to. <laughs> I, I, there. <laughs> I don't, I mean, I, 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 I mean, I, I don't even, I mean, I, I feel like I'm at, uh, yeah, 1910 at Comiskey Park. I mean, that is just beautiful. <laughs> I can zoom out, I can zoom in. I want to take a seat. I want to, uh, so uh, just, just so people can get an idea of, uh, of this. Um, what thoughts are in your mind when you're – so you've got plans. You've got, uh, uh, you know, the whole thought process laid out. How do you approach doing a project like this? Because we're talking the details involved here are – I mean, they're immense. I mean, I, I, I can only imagine. So where do you start? Really, I, I, I start from the big picture. Uh, much like building the real thing, you know, I'll start with the overall site. Uh, like in the case of Comiskey Park, you know, we probably I had a four block area, which I worked in. And then I start to hone in the details from there. Uh, mm-hmm. But uh, what I would do is, uh, you know, once I have the information I'm looking for, uh, plans, photos, uh, everything I use to build it from, uh, I'll literally start from the field and work my way out. Uh, I'll use uh, like in the case of Comiskey Park. Home plate is my origin point. So all my geometries in which I build the model okay. is related uh, to home plate. So all the grid lines, the trusses, the seating bowl, everything uh, has a method uh, in which uh, it's laid out from. So I try to uh, uh, create the geometry from a big picture and then uh, work the details in from there, pretty much from the ground up. I'll start with the, maybe the seating deck, the framing, uh, work my way up to the uh, – the roof, then uh, infill all the interior features, concessions, restrooms, things like that. It's beautiful. I mean, I, like I said, I could get lost on uh, on this. I, it, it really is. It just is fascinating. I mean, you could go to any point in the ballpark and literally feel like you are standing there. Uh, it, it's it's unbelievable. I mean, hats off to you, man. This is this is fantastic. <laughs> and and like you said, I mean, the reason to do it means even uh, more, I think, to uh, the greater scheme of things, because to realize when you're when you're there in the last stadium of in the last year of a stadium, um, what is this video here? This is the trailer. Yes, uh, I was able to. Uh, post so it's a little video gotcha. to, uh, So you're you're sitting there and you know 80 years is ending. Uh, and to be able to preserve it in this fashion is just fantastic. 
One of the things I'm exploring right now is the use of uh, augmented and virtual reality. And, uh, really? I was talking about, yeah, the, you know, advancement of technology, even in that side of the spectrum, uh, has really take, taken leaps and bounds in the last two or three years. It's starting to become more available. You know, it's That's, I there. mean, it's not, but this almost gives you that feel. I mean, it's, it's really amazing. Yeah. Yeah, my ultimate goal, and I, I, I'm, I'm kind of beta, test, uh, uh, beta testing some software right now. I'd like to be able to take a, like a tablet, uh, go over to 35th and Shields, I'll hold the tablet up, and I could have what's uh, augmented image of Comiskey Park or this model, and uh, you could walk around uh, as if, you, if you're actually there. Amazing. I mean, and, and, and like I said, it just blows me away. We're, we're, we're in... The clubhouse. I mean, uh, the home, the White Sox clubhouse, <laughs> right here. Yep. I mean, <laughs> really? I mean, it's just, it's unbelievable. Uh, I mean, to give people this experience, I think, is just, it's just fantastic. <laughs> and and uh, the press box. I mean, there is not a place that you did not. Uh, I mean, look at this. I mean, it it. it Gives you. I worked. Uh, you know how how my story with the Negro Leagues. Uh, yeah, back in the late '80s, early '90s, I worked for the AAA baseball team for the Philadelphia Phillies, the Scranton Wilkesbury Red Barons. So this view right here to me is what I used to see almost every day uh, when I was working there. Mm -hmm. I, during the games, um, I ran the scoreboard and the message board in the outfield. And uh, in 1992, uh, Reggie, Jackson uh, Reggie Jackson had a um, benefit for the Negro Leagues that um, he had many of the uh, players who were still with us at that time came, like Buck O'Neill, uh, Jimmy Crutchfield, Josh Gibson Jr., uh, uh, Jr. And, and that was where I finally heard, I heard those stories of the Negro Leagues, and I've been hooked ever since. And, and uh, like you said, a lot of these views that you show, you're showing here are uh, views that most fans would never get the opportunity to ever see the owner's office you've even got yep owner's office uh, i even have what's called the bard's room it's probably one of the most at the time it's probably one of the most uh sacred uh spots in baseball <laughs> very few people actually had the opportunity to go in there and charles comiskey um built his original park uh yeah he had a he had a designated room on the second level next to the office called the bard's room you know that's where uh let's well, uh, his friends went. Uh, it was kind of a, a place for uh, anybody who was anybody inside Chicago. Uh, only had the privilege uh, to be there. And uh, wow, you know, over the period of years, it grew. You know, uh, media was eventually allowed in there, but uh, not very many people saw some of these areas of the ballpark. And I wanted to give people oh, yeah, a sort yeah. of a virtual tour, you know, as to what it was like at the time. That's what this is. I, I mean, I can't even believe you've got uh, yeah. you've got the pictures in the jerseys on the wall and everything here i mean it's it's this yep. is beautiful <laughs> this is beautiful there there is uh um not many things i've seen <laughs> that uh, it makes me go you know wow <laughs> it is very very cool <laughs> so that's comiskey now you've done the same thing with league park as well yes, um i'm just going to throw that up for a minute real quick so uh People can see that, and then while we're while we're doing that, now I know Hamtramck, Hamtram, you do not have um, that same kind of virtual walk, but you've got a lot of 3D pictures as well, right? Right. Uh, and so, tell us the story behind uh, first League Park, I guess. How, why did you do League Park? And and this is another historic stadium that you've got on here that was built in 1891, went through several, uh, you know, revisions. Uh, what was what, what? Why did you do League Park next? League Park. Uh, well, uh, first of all, uh, my the roots uh, of my family are is from Cleveland, so I've always had an attachment to uh, city of Cleveland, Indians fan, uh, things like that. And uh, League Park, being one of the first few uh, concrete and steel ballparks, uh, certainly had its place in history. And uh, I think one aspect that allowed me to do League Park actually goes back when I was researching Comiskey. Uh, I had visited Cleveland uh, back in the mid nineties and uh, I visited a, an engine, engineering firm, you know, that uh, designed League Park, Osborne Engineering. And at that point in time, I was able, uh, still had copies of the original linens uh, that they used, you know, when they built the ballpark uh, for the 1910 renovations. So 
I'm thinking, oh gosh, since very few photographs existed of League Park. I'm looking at these drawings, I'm thinking, well, gosh, here's a side of the park probably the public has not seen in Absolutely you know, not. The, 70 years since it was demolished. Somebody's got to tell the story. <laughs> Absolutely. So, I'm glad, glad you did. <laughs> yeah. So, so, yeah, that's what I did. So as, as, concurrently as I was uh, researching Comiskey, you know, I, I always keep my eyes open, you know, for anything unique like that, like the drawings for League Park. Uh, fortunately, I was able, uh, I, I knew somebody who was, it was kind enough to uh, give me a set of drawings. So it was, uh, it made logical sense, maybe uh, League Park with my, family ties to Cleveland, maybe that would be the next park uh, that I would do. Believe it or not, League Park, it's not quite as romanticized as other mm -hmm. ballparks like Ebbets Field or uh, Forbes or Fenway. And I thought it was a good opportunity maybe to uh, give a little bit more exposure to the park. And I mean, look uh, at this. You could go in the dugout. I mean, I, I <laughs> boy, oh boy, <laughs> it's just beautiful. Uh, it really is. I mean, how many people have ever had this opportunity to see this view. I mean, uh, yeah. if people have not seen this before, I, I hope that they uh, they go and check all these out because it, it is uh, it is beautiful. Um, I, 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 I used to, that used to be one of my highlights of my day when I was there. And this is, we're talking AAA baseball. It wasn't even the major leagues. But before the game, we would um, go out in the outfield and shag fly balls while they were taking batting practice and, and hang out with these guys. And it was just like the highlight of my day uh, <laughs> to be able to do this. And uh, it really, I mean, this, to give this feel like this, and I can only imagine what a virtual reality uh, experience would be to be able to right. do the same thing would be so much fun. Yes. And uh, I think it's a good, good, uh, good, I guess, transition, if you would. Uh, I've actually been working with the Baseball Heritage Museum in Cleveland uh, to implement this exhibit uh, at the ballpark. Uh, I, I'd highly recommend if you or any people out there haven't had a chance to visit the Baseball Heritage Museum, it's definitely worth a visit. You know, okay. it's, it's housed in the old uh, ticket office of League Park, because when they demolished League Park back in 1951, uh, uh, the ticket office, part of the first base wall, and uh, some components uh, of uh, the dugout, you know, were, were still left there. And uh, you can still see it to this day, you know, if you visit there. So one of, one of the things we're working on uh, with the museum is uh, taking what you see here and uh, making it a permanent interactive exhibit. Amazing. That is great. I mean, I, I'm looking at this, right, and I'm picturing Tris Speaker out here. Um, and yep. I tell you what, it gives me goosebumps. You know, this is this is crazy stuff. I mean, it really is cool. Right. It really is a lot of fun. Uh, thank you for doing this, man. This is this is a lot of fun. And then, uh, so I just want to show them as well. Um, the well, we'll do we'll do one more. We'll do the if you're walking in the league park, um, buying yourself a ticket. I think that that's that would be. Uh, yeah, boy, oh, that's boy. actually a. Uh, got the process. I was able to put a few pictures up there. That, gotcha. Okay. You know, but okay. Uh, I, I do have uh, interior shots, you know, uh, much like Comiskey Park. Uh, you can walk the concourses, uh, check out the locker rooms. Uh, Amazing. The locker rooms. The I, I, I have to yeah. see. I have not. I want, where, where are they under? Uh, around it the would lock? be uh, scroll down just a little bit. Yeah, go uh, one more up above. Yeah. Uh, check out concourse. Yeah. Walk the concourse? Right, let's yeah, see yeah, what, I would love there. to. I would love to see what the uh, there's the concessions, the lower concourse, the sky bridge, the men's room. You've got a men's room in here. <laughs> oh my goodness! There's the Indians clubhouse. All right. <clears throat> I mean, I no. I mean, to be able to recreate this is just incredible. Um, very, very nice. I mean, it's beautiful. It really is. I mean, this this is. Uh, yeah. Beyond anything I could imagine, um, it really, really is. Look at that. I mean, you can picture these guys in in well. I mean, it was built in eighteen what ninety one or something like that. I mean, yeah, the original park done, was uh, yes eighteen ninety one, and then uh, the park you see here was the uh, renovated version uh, in nineteen ten. Nineteen ten, and then because uh, uh, the original park, much like a lot of the other ballparks uh, at that time, were built uh, mostly of wood and. Uh, you know, it was a very combustible material, and uh, Cleveland wanted to set the bar uh, with the new wave of parks coming in. At that point in time, 
Shy Park in Philadelphia and Forbes Field in Pittsburgh uh, were the only other two major league parks uh, that were concrete and steel. And uh, League Park was uh, was the third. Look at this. This is the view from behind. So yes, if you were oh, a manual oh, op scoreboard that operator, is yeah, you can toss your numbers. Absolutely cool. He <laughs> even got his little chair down here to sit in, huh? <laughs> his little stool is <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Great stuff. And so, um, like I had said, there was you've also got uh, Hamtramck on here as well. Now there isn't the same um, 3D. I don't think the same type of 3D, right. but you've got the drawings and, and the views and, and things like that, the site plans, uh, which is still great. What, what was the uh, the story behind this? Because there, there's been a lot, this has been in the news a number of times over the last couple of years. Yeah, yeah yes, it has. Uh, and I'm honored to uh, leading the, the restoration efforts uh, for the spa park uh, with my company, Smith Group. Uh, yeah, it does have a, a you know, the whole rehabilitation effort has quite a colorful history uh, going back to uh, 2012 when it was uh, put on the National Register of Historic Places. Mm -hmm. And uh, from there, there's a gentleman, uh, Gary Gillette, uh, who formed uh, the Friends of Hemtramck, the historic Hemtramck Stadium, just like uh, a very similar group uh, like we had at Rickwood Field in Birmingham. You know, they took it upon themselves to uh, solicit funds and work with various user groups to raise money, both on a a national and federal level, uh, as well as on a local level. And uh, it was in 27, late 2017, actually, uh, they put a request out uh, to solicit down. people, yeah, to solicit people uh, to help with renovation efforts. And uh, given my uh, experience with uh, Rickwood, uh, a little bit of League Park at that time, uh, a company that I worked for, uh, Smith Group, uh, they're headquartered out of Detroit. So uh, we threw our hat in the ring and uh, Yes, I've been, been fortunate uh, to uh, be a vital part of that effort. Uh, it's been happening uh, pretty systematically over the last uh, four years. Uh, first step in this whole process, uh, you can see some of the links on my website. Uh, we put together what was called a historic structures report. Uh, that uh, it's a federal document uh, put together uh, with the standards of the Department of the Interior that we could use uh, not only as a long-term planning document you know, for the community, but also use it as a tool to uh, get federal funds uh, to help finance the improvements uh, for this ballpark. Because, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's on the National Register of Historic Places. There are certain mm -hmm. things that you can and you can't do, you know, when it comes to historic rehabilitation. So we have to be very methodical, with the people that we engage to do that. So, yeah, I'm, pr I'm proud to say that, uh, yeah, the grandstand renovations are going to take place uh, pretty much this month. You know, they're starting uh, – uh, mobilize construction efforts and uh yeah if, if you ever get a chance to be there it's certainly worth a visit oh, it's really been a poor sh yeah the ballpark's been in very poor shape the last uh, several years so uh the first priority really is get, get the grandstands back up to a condition where people could sit in them again watch mm -hmm. a game you know have events to where they can uh, raise money to, to to finance further improvements of it awesome when uh, when was the last, when were the last games, do you know, that were actually played there? As far as I can tell, uh, games, uh, probably the mid to late 90s. Okay. And uh, I think it, shortly thereafter, uh, the city uh, condemned uh, the park uh, oh, because wow. it was unsafe. And at that point in time, it just more or less sat vacant. Uh, I think the city actually had plans to uh, well, raise the ballpark and then, uh, I mentioned uh, Gary uh, Gillette. Uh, yeah, he just uh, happened to, I would say, stumble across it. But uh, uh, yeah, before it was uh, put on the, uh, the National Register, you know, he thought, well, much like my vision, you know, some of my projects, well, we, we got to do something to save this park. So mm -hmm. he started the grassroots efforts that kickstarted uh, everything that you see to this day. Awesome. Now, you're also doing some work with the Major League Baseball Hall of Fame as well, right? What, what can you tell us about that? Uh, yeah, actually, it was, uh, uh, it was uh, earlier, probably uh, 15 or so years ago. But uh, yes, I did. Uh, it's one of the other milestones in my Comiskey Park uh, efforts. Uh, yeah, I was part of uh, the ballpark uh, exhibit that they had there when they put that together uh, in 2010. And uh, you know, they, if you ever get a chance to visit uh, the National uh, Baseball Hall of Fame, uh, they had a whole section devoted to the history of ballparks mm -hmm. and uh, uh they selected uh four ballparks 
uh, to highlight. Comiskey Park was one of them, Ebbets Field, and I think uh, South Avenue Grounds in Boston was another. Well, it might have just been those three, but uh, yeah, I'd worked with the uh, Hall of Fame to develop the Comiskey Park portion of that. So Awesome. <clears throat> so what projects are you going to be working on next? Well, uh, my next project is uh, Crosley Field in Cincinnati, Ohio. Nice. <laughs> nice. Uh, I'm just now starting that one, uh, much like uh, Comiskey uh, and boy, uh, League boy. Park. It was part of that first generation of ballparks that were very unique to their neighborhoods. And Crosley Field uh, is no exception to that. Mm -hmm. I bet that you, I bet you uh, in, in a short amount of time, few seconds a minute we could probably come up with a bunch of people to give you a thousand places that you could do this with that they would love to <laughs> see so many historic ballparks that would be so i mean it just would be wonderful to be able to see them in that same that same way that would be so much fun but you only have so much time in a day so crosley field you got any plans after that one well we'll, we'll kind, of, kind of see what happens after that uh i think a lot of it you know it's just timing uh uh I, I tell people it's really a couple things. I mean, one of the byproducts, one of the silver linings of the pandemic was that, you know, allowed me to uh, maybe yeah. take a deeper dive into some of these things. And I think a lot of other researchers can certainly attest to the same thing. So, but by doing that uh, uh, and forming band box ballparks uh, through my Twitter account and some of my other social media, I've been able to engage, you know, with other baseball fans, uh, and other mm -hmm. people who've experienced these parks firsthand. And uh, I think in my case, just hearing their stories and uh, the passion behind the communities, the teams in which they grew up rooting for mm -hmm. really has fueled my desire to uh, go forward with these projects. You know, Kiski Park is a great example where, uh, I mean, even though we're 30 years removed, uh, a lot of people still had uh, experiences in the ballpark. They're able to share personal experiences, you mm -hmm. know, with their fathers, their grandparents, maybe shed some details on parts that never really make it in the record books. So, mm -hmm. uh, uh, in a way, it's I would say crowdsourced, but I, I kind of feed off the stories and try to integrate that kind of stuff uh, within my projects. Awesome. I mean, yeah, I mean, the, the stories and the people that you could probably get that could contribute to that uh, would make yeah. it fun for everybody. And to be able to see, you know, I mean, I don't know, the Polo Grounds and Ebbets Field in that same yeah. way. I mean, that would be so much fun. Uh, what uh, what would be the timing on the Crosley Field project? You're, you're looking at another year out or? Uh, based on my experience, probably I, I, I don't really put uh, a time on it uh, mm -hmm. because it's, it's, you know, it just depends on how much time I have. But, uh, but yeah, it'd be nice to you know, try to get it within a year. Uh, yeah, if, if you go to my uh, Twitter feed, uh, at Sports Bandbox, uh, you could uh, kind of follow along the daily or weekly progress, you okay. know, as I... So I, I like to post weekly updates or even daily updates if, if I could mm -hmm. of my progress. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think by doing so, that engages, you know, my followers to get a personal dialogue with them and hear their mm -hmm. stories a little bit. And I think that's really what, like I said, makes this, pro makes this whole process very fun. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah. This was great. I, I, <clears throat> I was going to see if you wanted to see um... – the 3D models that I'm used to seeing because they look nothing like yours. But you know what? I don't know if I don't think I really want to waste waste time on that <laughs> because they they cannot compare. They they literally are like comparing something done with a crayon to uh, something done uh, that's in the Louvre. You know, like it, there's no there's no comparison. Uh, I I just uh, uh, I hope you have. Plenty of you, you can find the time to do these and do as many. Do you have anybody who helps you, or are you doing this all by yourself? That's been a solo effort. Oh yeah. wow! Uh huh. Yeah, but uh, you know, aside from people, you know, maybe uh, assisting, uh, maybe verifying information or something like that. But as far as the actual modeling and everything, I, I've done all done all this myself. Yep. So does it make it easier now that you've done a couple of them now? The process the next time through. Uh, I, I'm not sure how that works because I know obviously software changes like you mentioned and different things happen uh, that, that would make a process um, easier. Maybe you have to learn it. Th does it get easier as you do more or, or are they all pretty much going to take the same amount of effort? I think uh, it'll probably take the same amount of effort because uh, what's nice about these ballparks is they're all different and they all present their own you know set of challenges. But from a technical standpoint, uh, I've been able to streamline my process somewhat. 
you know, between Comiskey Park when I first started, uh, League and now Crosley, I've been able to uh, maybe tap into those resources. Uh, it's been, it's helped streamline some of my work efforts. But on the flip side of it too, you know, anytime you take on a new project, uh, there's a whole new set of research parameters, you know, you got to tackle uh, new things, you know, to investigate. And uh, I think compared to Comiskey and League Park, uh, one of the challenges I'm faced with Crosley is uh, I'm kind of doing this uh, as I learn. You know, mm -hmm. uh, unlike uh, uh, Wrigley and League, I, I, I acquired a lot of my information before I started, you know, modeling these projects versus uh, Crosley. It's been kind of a, happening concurrently. So, so people are kind of on the ride with me here, you know, as I mm -hmm. you know, try to figure things out. One good example would be is like a lot of these ballparks, you know, the diamonds uh, have shifted over a period of times. Sometimes uh, they're moved out. Sometimes they're rotated. Uh, you have a lot of conflicting information that you're trying to verify. You're trying to find out, okay, what did, what did certain things look like at a certain period of time? You know, you try to reconcile a lot of these differences. So interesting. That, I imagine that yeah. does make it difficult because you're trying to work back to something that, uh, uh, in many cases, is a century ago. <laughs> what? One more time. Exactly. I'm gonna. One more time. I'm gonna put it up so people can get the 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 flyover effect here and so that they know bandboxballparks.com. They need to go check it out and and get the feel for what it was like to be at League Park. And Comiskey, and coming in the near future, hopefully Crosley, and many, many more. <laughs> I think it's just, uh, uh, it's it's spectacular. I, I I tell you what, I haven't been to too many websites, Brian, where I could sit and look at the main screen, <laughs> and <laughs> I'm okay with that. I mean, what you know, I don't know, you know, if that was your uh, idea, how you how you came up with this, but. I don't even, I mean, I could just sit here and watch your main screen. I mean, it's just, uh, it's just great. It just really is. I, I, I appreciate the work you've done. I, I hope, uh, let me put you back on again here. I hope many other people um, can go check it out and, and also um, experience this stuff because it is uh, worth checking out. And I'm sure we'll be following along and seeing what you're going to be doing next. Absolutely, Philip. I really appreciate uh, you having me on. It's, uh, been, I'm always up to talk uh, ballparks, and it's always been a pleasure to awesome. share my information. Awesome, and thank you so much. I appreciate your time. I know you're you're busy. This is not your not your day job, and uh, uh, this was great to spend a little bit of time and, and take a look at this down down the road as you get closer. I'll be following you. I follow you on Twitter. So uh, as we go along here, uh, maybe down the road next you know months down the road, you get a little bit something you want to preview or anything like that. You you uh, are more than welcome to come on here and we can we can share it with people so i think that would be a lot of fun absolutely we'll do it again all right brian thank you so much for your time you have a great day and thank and, you thanks for having best me best of luck thank you for all this thank you appreciate it all right bye-bye thank you